Okay. Now, in this apostolate, we have a concept called climbing the mountain. And this is a very important concept because it's about our personal holiness. So if we can, and I did this before in this church, I was here before. If we picture this, a big mountain here, and at the top of the mountain is Jesus Christ. And let's just say, on the bottom of the mountain is us. So we're facing Christ. Behind us is the world with all its noise and all its drawing us into the world. We want to climb this mountain of holiness. It is work. It feels like hard work. You will feel yourself laboring. And we want to always consider what helps us climb our individual mountains of holiness. Now, the most important thing is our prayer life. We have to have discipline in our prayer life. We have to do the same things every day. Most of us are going to get up every day and do the same things over and over again. Isn't it true? We have to make our prayer life a certainty. Jesus has to have time with us. He has to be able to get with us or we will wander. So our, the sacraments will help us climb the mountain. Confession will help us climb the mountain. And I will talk about self-hatred in a minute. But the sacrament of confession, when you go in and you confess your sins, the priest is there and he transmits this heavenly grace and you have to trust him. When he says you're forgiven and go in peace, you have to leave your sins with him and go. He's telling the truth. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. If you Sometimes we carry around this 100-pound weight, and we, we're just dejected about it. No. If God forgives us, God forgives us. So the sacraments, uh, the Eucharist, will help us to climb our mountain of holiness. OK, silence. There must be time in each day for silence. Contemplative prayer, 10 minutes before the crucifix. Every lover of Christ will find himself at the foot of the cross. And you can com contemplate Jesus in silence. The Lord knows your burdens. He knows your pain. The only way your suffering will make sense and be bearable is if you bring it to Christ. And in the crucified Christ, you will find meaning. And when you are interested in the pain of Jesus, in the silence before the cross, something beautiful will happen. And Jesus will begin whispering into your soul. And these whispers from the cross are the beginning of intimacy. This is the vertical relationship this intimacy with Christ. Christ will whisper his pain into your soul. And this is, this is why this is so important. As receptacles of God's mercy, we want to offer what is authentically Christ. And so I'll tell you, I did an experiment. I wanted to be so merciful. I thought, I am going to do a mercy experiment. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up. And everyone I meet, I am going to apply the most possible amount of mercy to them. They could be serial killers, and I'll just be, mercy, 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 mercy. I'll view them with the most compassion. It'll be amazing. I'm going to practice this. I thought, I am going to practice to see if I can do it. I tell you, I got up the next morning very excited about this, and I almost made it to the kitchen before I judged someone harshly. <laughs> but the experiment was flawed. It was flawed because, you see, I forgot something. I hadn't factored in that the greatest call for mercy would occur in my family, in the people around me my saintly husband, and my beautiful teenagers. <laughs> Mercy presses on you a little bit when you're dealing with, you know, teenagers. So I thought, OK, I have learned an important truth. Mercy begins at home. 
What was my point? Let me think about it. Yes. When Jesus whispers into your heart, when you have this relationship with the Lord and you allow him to whisper into your heart, here's what he's going to say. He's going to talk to you about the people he has chosen that you walk through life with. And he's going to whisper to you his hopes for them. And he's going to enlighten for you their pain. And he is going to inspire you not only to view them with the most mercy, but how to minister to them. The best thing the Lord can do is tell us what not to do. Isn't it true? And what I've learned from this is most times in difficult circumstances, if I say nothing, it will be okay. A lot of times just listening, compassionate listening, is the holiest and best uh, response to those around me. So at the foot of the cross, you will begin your intimate relationship with Jesus. We think about the Lord, and as the Lord looked down from the cross, who was there? Jesus had 12 apostles. How many were at the foot of the cross? One. St. John, a blessed mother, because that's how mothers are, and uh, Mary. But I'm thinking about these 12 apostles. I'm thinking, what qualified St. John to be present at the most pivotal moment in the redemption of mankind? Two things, as far as I can see. Number one, he showed up. On Good Friday, John reported for duty. Not everybody did. Now, that's what the Bible tells us. That's how we know that John was there. The Bible tells us John was there. Here's what the Bible doesn't tell us. John was scared to death. John felt sick to his stomach about what they were doing for Jesus. John wasn't sure he could protect Our Lady. John had doubts. He thought, could this really be the plan? It doesn't tell us he had doubts. He was afraid. He was hungry. He was tired. It just says he showed up. He was there. The second thing that, you know, um, enabled John to be present was that he stayed. John showed up, and then John stayed. Not everybody did, right? But John stayed. Now, was John known as the tough guy? Was he the brave guy, the warrior? John was the lover. And see, this is how we get strong, through love. John the Beloved, they called him. John's love helped him to remain. The day got uglier and uglier. The crowds got uglier and uglier. And John stayed. So we, in our lives, are suffering. There's no question. People who have been called to the apostolate carry crosses. If we will sacrifice for Christ, if we offer this, if we're willing, he will take, our, take us up on it. Isn't it true? Isn't he asking you for sacrifice? He's asking our team for sacrifice. And so we have to stay. We have to stay in it even though it's difficult. Now, Peter didn't do as well on that day. Peter denied Christ. I bet he was afraid. I bet he was terrified. I bet he was tired. I bet he was confused under serious attack. And God allowed that to happen. He could have spared Peter the temptation, but he didn't. He allowed Peter to be tempted. He allowed Peter to experience failure. But what's the end of the story? Peter came back, he repented, and then God founded our Catholic Church upon Peter. So we have a historical precedent for the need for repentance. We are none of us perfect. We are all of us necessary. So Peter repented and he came back.